Today we're going to look at momentum and impulse. So what is momentum? Well by definition momentum is the product of mass and velocity. So as an equation we'd write that P for momentum and of course momentum is going to be a vector because it's mass times velocity and velocity is a vector. The units are going to be the units for mass, the SI units for mass, which is kilograms, times the SI units for velocity, which is meters per second. And of course, we got to remember that this is a vector quantity. So what is this momentum a measure of? Well, we might say it's a measure of oomph. Don't use that word on a test, but the more oomph something has, the more momentum it has. That is if it's got lots of oomph, it means it's going to be hard to stop. Objects with lots of mass and lots of velocity are, of course, the most difficult to stop. We could also say it's a measure of moving inertia. Inertia is the ability of something to resist change. So something with a lot of inertia has a lot of ability to resist changes to its motion. That is, it has lots of moving inertia. It's hard to stop. We sometimes use the word momentum in everyday situations. And we might talk about a basketball team having a lot of momentum. That means that they've scored a lot of points in a row. They're on a streak. And they're difficult to stop. And we like momentum because it's a conserved quantity. At least in collisions and explosions. So that makes it very useful. So in the same way that we have a law of conservation of energy, we also have a law of conservation of momentum. And that's going to be a very useful tool for us. So how might we use this quantity called momentum? Let's take a look at this situation. We've got a 100 kilogram linebacker here running with a speed of 5 meters per second. And he's going to collide with a 75 kilogram running back who's running at 9 meters per second. So if we now calculate the momentum of the linebacker and the running back, mass times speed gives me 500 kilograms times meters per second. For the linebacker who's moving to the right, whereas our running back here has a mass of 75 times 9, that would be 675 kilograms times meters per second of momentum, but that's moving to the left. So if they now collide, we've got more momentum to the left in the direction of the running back. And so the running back is harder to stop. So if they fall, they're going to fall in the direction that the running back is moving. So up to this point in the course, we said that Newton's second law was that the net force or the resultant force was equal to the mass times the acceleration. But this really only applies here if we've got a constant mass. The more sophisticated, more general way of writing Newton's second law is that the net force is equal to the rate of change of momentum, the momentum change over the time interval. So if momentum is mass times velocity, then the net force would equal the change in mass times velocity per unit time. Now, with some calculus, we could write this as a velocity times the rate of change of mass plus the mass times the rate of change of velocity. But this is kind of a difficult equation because the velocity here isn't constant and the mass here isn't constant. So the only cases where we've really got the tools to deal with this equation are the cases when we have a constant mass or we've got a constant velocity. If we've got a constant mass, then of course this change in mass over time term is going to be 0. And we're going to be back to f net equals mass times change in velocity over time, 
or acceleration. That one we're quite familiar with. What's going to be new is when you've got a constant velocity here. And we're talking here about a case such as water coming out of a hose. So the water moves out of the hose with a constant velocity. However, the amount of water that has come out of the hole is constantly increasing. We're always increasing the amount of mass that has come out of the hose. So in that case, we've got a constant velocity. So it's this term that would go out. And we'd be left with the net force equal to that constant velocity times the rate of change of mass, how quickly the mass is typically being ejected from something. And we'll deal with this case in a later video on fluid jets. So if we take this more general Newton 2 equation, that the net force is equal to the rate of change of momentum, and we multiply both sides by that time interval, then we get that F net times that time interval will be equal to the change in momentum. And we actually give this product here on the left side a new name. We call that the impulse. And we usually represent it by the symbol I. So the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. And what this equation is saying, basically, is that let's say I've got one of those chairs on wheels. And I give it a force of 10 newtons. It's going to speed up. Now, if I give it the same force, but I apply that force for twice as long, in other words, I extend my push for more time, then I will get a bigger change in momentum. The chair is going to speed up more. So how much something changes its momentum, how much something speeds up, depends not just on the force applied, but also how much time do you apply that force. So by definition, impulse is force times time. And that causes changes in momentum. Now a little later in the course, we're going to do something very, very similar. Because if you apply a force over a greater distance, of course, that causes bigger changes as well. And we're going to call this product of force times distance the work done. And work will cause changes in energy. So we get a direct parallel between these two quantities. Force times time causes change in momentum. Force times distance will cause change in energy. They're related, but they're not the same thing. Let's borrow a little example from Paul Hewitt to see if we can get a better idea of the way that impulse works. So imagine we've got a big bus with a windshield, and there is a bug that flies along and crashes into the windshield. What I'd like you to do is to compare the forces on the bug and the bus, and then the time of impact on the bug and the bus, etc. So pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer forces on the bug in the bus, well, they have to be the same. And why is that? Because of Newton 3. That's an action-reaction pair. Force of bus on bug equals the force of the bug on the bus. Compare the time of impact. Well, the bug can only be in contact with the bus when the bus is in contact with the bug. So those two have to be the same. Compare the impulse. Well, the impulse is by definition equal to the amount of force times the amount of time. And we said the force was the same, and the time was the same, so those two must also be the same. We also said that impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So if the two impulses are the same, then the two changes in momentum must also be the same. So the bus hardly changes its velocity at all, but it has a very big mass to make up for it. 
the bug changes its velocity a lot. It turns right around, bouncing off the windshield. But it only has a tiny mass. That is to say, the bus hardly changes its velocity, so it has a small acceleration. Very small. Whereas the bug turns right around, it's got a big acceleration. And of course, which one is damaged more? Well, the one that goes through that really big acceleration. That would be the bug. Now, our little equation here, impulse equals change in momentum, it can tell us how we can bring an object to a stop without doing damage to it. So I'm going to make this into a magnitude equation. So the size of the impulse will equal the size of the change in momentum. I'm not going to be concerned about direction here. So let's imagine our truck. We're going to bring it to a stop. So we're going to change its momentum by mv final minus mv initial. But of course, mv final is 0. So we're going to end up here with the magnitude of the change in momentum equaling the mass times the initial velocity of, of the truck. That is the initial momentum of the truck. Impulse is of course equal to force times time. So we can bring our truck slowly to a stop by having it go through a stack of hay. Or we can bring it very suddenly in a very short amount of time to a stop. In either case the impulse has to be the same and the change in momentum has to be the same. So in the first case it takes a long amount of time to bring the truck to a stop. So a small force can be applied to get that same change in momentum. In the second case, though, the amount of time is very small. So a big, so a big force has to be applied so that this product of force times time still comes out the same. And it's this big force right here that does damage. So that's why boxers ride with the punch. They bring their head back as the punch is moving in, thereby lengthening the time of contact. And by lengthening the time of contact, the force on the face is decreased. Or if we want to catch an egg, we bring our hand out in front of our body and then bring it back a long ways. So the amount of time it takes to bring that egg to a stop is elongated and the force is decreased and the egg doesn't break. Let's take a look at bouncing. Turns out bouncing has a lot to do with impulse and change in momentum. So we've got two situations here. In the first case we've got a sticky wall and a sticky ball. We throw the ball at the wall and it sticks to the wall. But in the second situation, it's the more common situation where the ball bounces off the wall. What I'd like you to do is calculate the change in momentum in both cases. So pause the video, try that, come back for the answer. Okay, so a change in any quantity is simply equal to the final value of that quantity minus the initial value of that quantity. And momentum is, of course, mass times velocity, so we'd have a final velocity there and we'd have an initial velocity there. Our mass is of course 1, but when it sticks to the wall, the final velocity here is 0. And our initial velocity here was 3. So we're going to get a change in momentum of negative 3 units. Kilograms times meters per second would be the units. So that negative sign simply means that the change in momentum was to the left. That is, the wall is pushing to the left on the ball, so it changes its momentum to the left. So let's try it now with the bounce. The change momentum will equal the final value minus the initial value. Mass is 1 in both cases. It, the final velocity here would be 1. And the initial velocity was 3. So the final answer would be 1 minus 3, which is negative 2. If you did it that way, you got it wrong. Because momentum here is a vector. 
So up here, our velocity was to the right. So this was really a plus 3. Down here, our final velocity was to the left. That's really a minus 1. Our initial velocity was to the right. So that was a plus 3. So the correct answer here should be minus 1, minus 3, or negative 4. And the size of our change of momentum, the magnitude of our change of momentum would be 4 units. Whereas in this case, the magnitude of the change of momentum was only 3 units. And of course, since 4 is bigger than 3, we have a bigger change in momentum when we have bouncing. Bigger change in momentum when objects bounce. And of course, impulse equals change in momentum, so that also means we get a bigger impulse when objects bounce. So there's also a bigger impulse. Back when I was in high school, we used to play a game where you'd sneak up behind a guy and you'd punch them in the arm. And we learned that those punches that kind of bounced off the arm, they stung the most, they hurt the most. Your arm would just be hanging in pain for the rest of the day. So it's not a game I recommend, but it is good physics. So where do we get this bigger change of momentum, bigger impulse when we are bouncing? We can kind of understand that a little better by making an analogy to a skateboarder and a medicine ball. So rather than having the wall that can't move being hit by the ball, and sometimes it sticks and sometimes it bounces, we're going to have a kid on a skateboard and we're going to throw a medicine ball at him. So naturally, when he catches that medicine ball, that gives him some backwards momentum. But when the ball hits the wall and it bounces back, then it's like the kid not only catches the ball, but he throws it out again. So we can imagine while he's rolling backwards, he throws the ball back out again. So whereas catching was kind of a first impulse, throwing it back is like a second impulse. And the boy in the skateboard goes backwards with greater momentum. So when the ball hits the wall, it's like the wall catching the ball. But when the ball bounces back again, it's like the wall throwing it. So we get a double impulse, once for catching, once for throwing. In fact, as a quick way to calculate the magnitude of the change in momentum when there's bouncing, it's just going to be equal to the mass of the object times the sum of the speeds. One would be the incoming speed, one would be the outgoing speed. Sum them up, multiply the mass, that's always going to equal the magnitude of the change in momentum. Here's an IB question where you can try that out. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So it's the magnitude of the change in momentum, that magnitude will be equal to the mass times the sum of the speeds. So we don't have to consider the velocities here. We know one velocity is incoming, the other velocity is outgoing. So we've got a 2 kilogram mass and the sum of the speeds would be 7 plus 3. So we're going to get a change in momentum of 20 units. That's 20 kilograms times meters per second, which is equal to 20 newton seconds. So the correct answer here is D. Here's a second IB question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So let's do the force first. The force on the ball from the wall has to be to the left. It's really a normal force from the wall. So it's got to be to the left. It's either going to be B or D. And it's the magnitude, once again, of the change in momentum. So that magnitude has to equal the mass, M, times the sum of the speeds, V plus V. So the correct answer would be D. Here we have a typical impulse equals change in momentum problem. Pause the video, try the question, 
come back for the answer. So the first thing we want to notice is that we have the information for the impulse. So impulse equals force times time interval. The force was 5 newtons. It was applied for 0 0.4 seconds. So we're going to get an impulse there of 2 newton seconds. But of course, this has to be equal to the change in momentum of the object, which is its final momentum minus its initial momentum. The initial momentum was zero because it was at rest. So our final momentum will be the mass of the object times the final speed of the object, which is what we're looking for. So we've got to get that two newton seconds must be equal to the mass of two kilograms times that final speed. So our final speed is going to be one meter per second. If we want to make this into a velocity and talk about the direction, well the direction is just going to be the same direction as the force. So the velocity is one meter per second in the same direction as the force. Now we might have made a graph for that force that was applied for 0.4 seconds. So it was a 5 newton force and it was applied for 0 0.4 seconds. So we had a constant force for a given amount of time. Now of course the area under here would be the force times the time. The area would be equal to the impulse. So for instance if we had applied a force of 20 newtons for a time here of this would be 0 0.1 second then the areas would be the same and the forces would be the same. 20 newtons times 0.1 second would once again be 2 newton seconds. And then of course the impulses would be the same. Now in most cases when we apply a force such as from a tennis racket we don't apply a constant force. Usually the force increases rapidly to a peak value and then decreases rapidly to zero. So it's likely to look maybe a little more like so, but to have the same area. And our general relationship is that the area under a force time graph is equal to the impulse. And of course the impulse will equal the change in momentum. Okay, so in this problem we've got a tennis racket and we've got a tennis ball coming in with a mass of 0 0.06 kilograms or 60 grams. It's got a speed of 40 meters per second. I've got it moving to the left here so I'm going to give that a velocity of negative 40 and then it's going to bounce out and we want to find out what that final velocity is. So the first thing we're going to have to do is figure out the impulse exerted. And the impulse will equal the area under this curve. So the impulse will equal the area under the curve. And that's going to equal the impulse per one of these grids here. Here's one grid. So it's going to equal the impulse per grid times the number of grids under the curve. Impulse per grid, well that would be 5 newtons times this time interval here, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 1, or 0 0.1 seconds. So each one of those squares is worth 0.5 newton seconds. And now we've got to count up how many of these grids that we have. Now we could do this by just estimating how much of a full grid we have each time. So for instance, this would be one grid, two grids. This looks like about 0.95 grids. This would be a full grid. This would be maybe 0.8 grids. We'd add those all up. Another way to do it is to just make a rectangle that has the same size area as the curve. So I can see here that the non-overlapping areas are about equal this non-overlapping area plus this non-overlapping area will approximately equal this non-overlapping area plus this one plus this one. So if I count these up, now I've got about 11 grids.
So now I can multiply that together. And I should get 5.5 newton seconds for the total impulse exerted on the tennis ball. And that has to be equal to the change in momentum, which would equal the mass of the tennis ball times the final velocity minus the mass of the tennis ball times the initial velocity. And those are as vectors. So I'll common factor the mass out, 0 0.06. V final, that's what I want to determine. And hopefully that's going to come out with a positive value indicating a direction to the right. Minus my initial velocity here, which would be the negative 40. And that all has to equal 5.5. And I think if you work that out, you should get a final velocity of 52 meters per second. And that would be positive to the right. Let's summarize the main ideas from the video. The first idea was that momentum was defined as mass times velocity. And it's a measure of how hard it is to stop, or we could say it's a measure of the moving inertia of an object. We then introduced something called impulse, and its definition was it would be equal to the average force applied times the amount of time that force was applied. In other words, impulse is equal to the product of force and time. And then we saw that impulse causes change in momentum. And so we ended up with this new way to write Newton's second law that impulse is equal to change in momentum. This is just Newton 2 all over again. We talked about how we could reduce damage by increasing the time interval that a force is applied. So to bring an object to a stop, the change in momentum is always the same, and that's always equal to the impulse. But we could use a little force over a long amount of time, or we could use a big force over a small amount of time in order to bring the object to a stop. We saw that in bouncing, the magnitude of the ch change in momentum, which of course is equal to the impulse, will be given by the mass of the object times the sum of the speeds, the incoming and outgoing speeds. And then finally, we looked at these force time graphs. We realized that most forces are not constant, that they reach a peak and then they die off quickly. And we said that the impulse will be equal to the area under the curve. And then, of course, impulse is equal to the change in momentum. And we could use that to make calculations such as determining the final velocity of a tennis ball or a golf ball. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.